Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Schultz. Today we have the conclusion of part four of A Voyage to Lilliput. Our hero has, well, taken care of the fleet, but has earned the ire of the Emperor for rejecting a call to exterminate his opponents. This is part four, again, of A Voyage to Lilliput. His Majesty desired that I would take some opportunity to bring all the rest of his enemy's ships into his ports, and seemed to think of nothing less than conquering the whole empire of Blefuscu, and becoming the sole monarch of the world. But I plainly protested that I would never be the means of bringing a free and brave people into slavery, and though the wisest of the ministers were of my opinion, my open refusal was so opposed by His Majesty's ambition that he could never forgive me. And from this time... A plot began between himself and those of his ministers who were my enemies that nearly ended in my utter destruction. About three weeks after this exploit, there arrived an embassy from Berflescu with humble offers of peace, which was soon concluded on terms very advantageous to our emperor. There were six ambassadors with a train of about five hundred persons, all very magnificent. Having been privately told that I had befriended them, they made me a visit and paying me many compliments on my valor and generosity, invited me to their kingdom in the emperor, their master's name. I asked them to present my most humble respects to the emperor, their master, whose royal person I resolved to attend before I returned to my own country. Accordingly, the next time I had the honor to see our emperor, I desired his general permission to visit the Bliscudian monarch. This he granted me, but in a very cold manner of which afterwards I learned the reason. When I was just preparing to pay my respects to the Emperor of Blefusugu, a very distinguished person at court, to whom I had once done a great service, came to my house very privately at night, and without sending his name desired admission. I put his lordship into my coat pocket, and giving orders to a trusty servant to admit no one, I fastened the door, placed my visitor on the table, and sat down by it. His lordship's face was full of trouble, and he asked me to hear him with patience in a matter that highly concerned my honor and my life. You are aware, he said, that Skyresh Bolgolam has been your mortal enemy ever since your arrival, and his hatred is increased since your great success against Blefuscu, by which his glory as admiral is obscured. This lord and others have accused you of treason, and several councils have been called in the most private manner on your account. Out of gratitude of your favors, I procured information of the whole proceedings, venturing my head for your service, and this was the charge against you. First, that you, having brought the imperial fleet of Blefuscu into the royal port, were commanded by his majesty to seize all the other ships, and to put to death all the Begendian exiles, and also all the people of the empire who would not immediately consent to break their eggs at the smaller end, and that, Like a false traitor to his most serene majesty, you excused yourself from the service on pretense of unwillingness to force the consciences and destroy the liberties and lives of an innocent people. Again, when ambassadors arrived from the court of Blefuscu, like a false traitor, you aided and entertained them, though you knew them to be servants of a prince lately in open war against his imperial majesty. Moreover, you are now preparing, contrary to the duty of a faithful subject, to voyage to the court of Lefuscu. In the debate on this charge, my friend continued, His Majesty often urged the services you had done him, while the Admiral and Treasurer insisted that you should be put to a shameful death. By Reldresol, Secretary for Private Affairs, who has always proved himself your friend, suggested that if His Majesty would please to spare your life and only give orders to put out both your eyes, justice might in some measure be satisfied. At this, Bolgolam rose up in a fury, wondering how the secretary dared desire to preserve the life of a traitor, and the treasurer, pointing out the expense of keeping you, also urged your death. But his majesty was graciously pleased to say that since the council thought the loss of your eyes too easy a punishment, some other might afterwards be inflicted. And the secretary, humbly desiring to be heard again, said that, as to expense your allowance might be gradually lessened, so that, for want of sufficient food, you should grow weak and faint and die in a few months when his majesty's subjects might cut your flesh from their bones and bury it, leaving a skeleton for the admiration of posterity. Thus, through the great friendship of the secretary, the affair was arranged, 
It was commanded the plan of starving you by degrees should be kept a secret, but the sentence of putting out your eyes was entered on the books. In three days, your friend the secretary will come to your house and read the accusation before you, and point out the great mercy of his majesty only condemns you to the loss of your eyes, which he does not doubt you will submit to humbly and gracefully. Twenty of his majesty's surgeons will attend to see the operation well performed by discharging very sharp-pointed arrows into the balls of your eyes as you lie on the ground. I leave you, said my friend, to consider what measures you will take, and to escape suspicion, I must immediately return as secretly as I came. His lordship did so, and I remained alone in great perplexity. At first I was bent on resistance, for while I had liberty I could easily with stones pelt the metropolis to pieces. But I soon rejected that idea with horror, remembering the oath I had made to the emperor and the favors I had received from him. At last, having his majesty's leave to pay my respects to the emperor of Belfuscu, I resolved to take this opportunity. Before the three days had passed, I wrote a letter to my friend, the secretary, telling him of my resolution, and without waiting for an answer went to the coast, and entering the channel, between wading and swimming, reached the capital port of Belfuscu, where the people, who had long expected me, led me to the capital. His Majesty, with the royal family and great officers of the court, came out to receive me, and they entertained me in a manner suited to the generosity of so great a prince. I did not, however, mention my disgrace with the Emperor of Lilliput, since I did not suppose that prince would disclose the secret while I was out of his power. But in this it soon appeared, I was deceived. And that is the end of the penultimate chapter of A Voyage to Lilliput. When next we rejoin, we will hear the conclusion.